This is Dr. Ben Thompson and Dr. Michelle Neidelman Kennedy, audiologist with Treble Health. And we are here for a special live stream, sharing our secret keys, sharing our insider knowledge for tinnitus treatment. The first thing we're going to talk about is some advice around how long and how often should someone use sound therapy. Dr. Michelle, you were coming across different perspectives on this. Give us some background and set the scene for why this might be confusing for a patient or an individual to try to understand how to approach sound therapy for tinnitus treatment. What do you think? Sure, absolutely. So a lot of people that I speak with on a regular basis will ask me about sound therapy because they've read about it online and they wonder, well, does sound therapy just mean having background noise? And is that enough? Or does it mean some kind of specialized program for sounds that you're going to be listening to regularly? And the answer is, it's both. And, you know, that's, that's a tool that you can use um, in either element, whether it's for a designated amount of time per day, or whether it is for most of your waking hours when you're primarily in silent environments because you'll find, you'll come across a lot of different perspectives on that. I mean, have you seen that too, Dr. Ben? I definitely have seen some different, different perspectives, different people have different things to say. Um, patients come to me and they, they are surprised when I say, yeah, we, we don't want you to be sitting through tinnitus in silence. And they're surprised. And I think um, there's there's messages out there, whether it's online, different people who say, personally, I did this and I got better doing this. And then that story gets out there and it can put this message inside the the mind of someone of, oh, well, I need to do what that what they're doing. So that's one one thing that I do see. There's different online forums, there's different YouTube channels, there's different websites, Reddit groups, right? Some of them are more credible than others. Even amongst professionals, it's not always the same answer. Um, the way that I learned tinnitus treatment is tinnitus retraining therapy, which is one of the major protocols to follow. And I can explain that, and I will in just a moment. Dr. Michelle, what other uh, fundamental approaches have you come across in terms of different sound therapy perspectives? Is it, have there been other research groups or individuals, maybe mentors along, along your career that you've come across that have said different things? in terms of sound therapy use? I think it comes, my, my background with sound therapy use definitely comes from past devices for helping tinnitus in terms of like neuromonics or Desyncra. Those were um, device therapies that required you to listen to sounds for an extended period of time, several hours every day um, versus the sound therapy that a lot of hearing aids offer, which are sounds that you're gonna be listening to the entire time you're wearing the hearing aids. And then there's the methods from different types of research studies that I've read in terms of helping manage tinnitus, whether it's again, like maybe two periods of time, two 50 minute periods of time a day that you're listening to some kind of sound, or perhaps it's listening to pink or white noise throughout all of your waking hours. So there's a lot of variability. I think that something that you need to know is that you have to make sure the sound is something that is pleasant and positive for you. Because again, like what Dr. Ben had said, just because someone felt like their tinnitus improved after eight hours a day of listening to white noise, if for you, even 10 minutes of listening to white noise gives you a headache and is more disturbing, it's not going to be the tool for you to help manage your tinnitus. So there has to be a neutral or a positive response from the brain, not necessarily from, 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 my, from my emotion or not necessarily from just how I think about it, but like that, that deeper part of the brain has to respond or react to, to, to the sound therapy in a more neutral way. So yes, I totally agree with that. And then what kind of sounds can be used for the sound therapy? Well, that's, that's a little different conversation, which I would like to go into later, the first point that we wanted to bring up is how many hours a day should someone be using sound therapy? And the second point would be for how many weeks, months, or years should they be using it? So for the first part, I studied tinnitus retraining therapy as, as the major protocol that I've been implementing with patients. And overall, it's been successful. What we see for those patients who are getting better is 
they're typically using sound therapy more often than the group who's not getting better from what I'm seeing. So that is a factor. And this has been, you know, common shared professional knowledge in our, in our community for decades, right? That there is something to sound therapy. Um, sound enrichment is a principle that's important to explain because sound can come from many places. It can come from natural uh, sound in the room I'm in. If it's music or uh, the sound of an air purifier or a fan or something like that, that is natural sound, low level sound that might count for your sound therapy. If it's loud enough, then it might count for your sound therapy. Then there's more structured, more medical style sound therapy, like the sound oasis, sound machines, sound generators, tinnitus maskers through us. That's one option. Hearing aids. That's another option for sound therapy. And I typically recommend to patients to use it more often than not. Most people who are committing to the sound therapy protocols are using, using it for six to 12 hours a day. And then for those other times of the day, they have natural sound going on. So they have sound enrichment for, for a vast majority of the day. And I'm seeing success with that. Of course, in isolation, it's, it's not as good as a full comprehensive program with one of our staff, for example. But in isolation, it's better than, than not doing it. Um, Dr. Michelle, when a patient asks, how often should I use sound therapy? What are the follow-up questions that you might ask them to better understand and better recommend? Yeah, I'll ask them, generally speaking, what kinds of environments they're in on a daily basis, uh, what their lifestyle is like. So, for example, I've had a patient today. She's told me she has a few children. She also um, works in a loud environment. So at, when she's at work, she has enough background noise to kind of distract her from the tinnitus. It's more in the quiet times that she notices her tinnitus is more pronounced and sometimes at home, but naturally she wouldn't want to plug up her ears with earphones or headphones because she has her family around her when she's at home. So in that case, someone who really needs to be able to hear everything around them and hear others, especially their children or their love, you know, their significant others, they may benefit better from using something like the bone conduction headphones that allow their ears to be out and open so they can still hear everyone, but they also still have some low level sound therapy going on internally. Um, so for someone who definitely needs to hear things in their environment, I would never recommend to use earphones or headphones just because you want to, you don't want to lose access to that just to be able to manage your tinnitus. And you can really kill two birds with one stone when you have something like the bone conduction headphones or even ear level sound generators or hearing aids that don't completely occlude your ears so that you're still able to hear everything in your environment in addition to the sound that you have selected. I also wanted to, I saw a quick question that someone had, let's see, so Steph asked, so the sound therapy has to be pleasant to us. And just to kind of reiterate, yes, we'd want you to have a sound that you find enjoyable and pleasant and agreeable. It's going to be counterproductive because we know that the response of tinnitus really lie, relies heavily on how the limbic system, the emotional centers of the brain respond to tinnitus. So oftentimes negative, um, negative associations are made with tinnitus. And so we wouldn't want you to add another sound that has any kind of negative um, associ associations for you. So it can definitely be a neutral positive sound, whether it's music, nature, if white noise or pink noise or any kind of noise is pleasant for you, then that's fine. But we just wouldn't, the, the benefit of using sound therapy is lost if you're using a sound that you find agitating. Let's bring in some of the live questions. If you guys are here watching live, let us know. We're going to put up the screen right now. Let us know where you're coming from and we'll give you a shout out. See Andres, I also see Donnie, Jay, Steph, and others on the side here. Welcome everyone. All right, so the, you know, the, the professional tips, the professional secrets about sound therapy, really, what are they? Well, one thing that we want to make clear is for those who are looking for the best way to achieve sound therapy, they're usually considering ear level devices like tinnitus maskers, like ear level sound generators, or hearing aids that are programmed for tinnitus. And it's important to 
lay out all the options from the low cost options up to the the gold standard. And I have felt that in some of my videos, I, I maybe didn't make it so clear that the gold standard for sound therapy is often ear level devices like tinnitus maskers or hearing aids. Dr. Michelle, you worked at a major hospital in New York City. What was the typical recommendation for someone who, let's say, has a milder degree of hearing loss who comes into the clinic for tinnitus and you're recommending different treatment options? Would you say that also at, at a major hospital in New York that um, tinnitus maskers or hearing aids were recommended to those patients? And if, if not always, then then why not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime someone had any degree of hearing loss, and if they noted having difficulty hearing in any situation, then we all always were recommending the use of hearing aids. And then on top of that, if they were complaining of tinnitus as well, then we often also recommended hearing aids, but with uh, tinnitus maskers. And so oftentimes the individual, depending on whether or not the tinnitus was disruptive all the time or at specific times, we may have programs, specific tinnitus program versus having the, the masker, the masking noise, the background noise all the time in the general program that the hearing aid would start up on. So that way the individual could have the option of adjusting and choosing when they wanna have that masking noise put in. And oftentimes, they have now Bluetooth hearing aids, so they would also be advised as to some of the tinnitus apps that they could use to help stream their own kinds of sounds. So if they didn't want to use the built-in sounds that the hearing aid um, had, they could also select individual sounds that help them. And we could adjust the mix ratio between how much amplification, how loud the amplification is from the hearing aid versus how loud the tinnitus masker or the, the Bluetooth streaming was. So that way they could have the streaming audio, whether it was like, you know, some kind of nature sound or a white noise playing at, a, let's say, 20% of the volume of the amp general amplification. So there's a lot of different modifications that we were able to do. But generally speaking, we would recommend hearing aids with a tinnitus program and definitely hearing aids that had Bluetooth, which now seems to be the norm. Most hearing aids that you could get on the market have Bluetooth capabilities. And something else that for someone who has a mild hearing loss, where maybe the hearing loss is secondary to the tinnitus, there are different levels of technology for hearing aids. And so for that individual, we would oftentimes recommend more of an entry level hearing aid because they aren't having many difficulties in different listening environments or not having difficulty listening in noise. So it wasn't very necessary for them to have um, have to spend a lot of money on high, you know, the premium technology hearing aids if those aren't the needs and the difficulties that that person is having. Thank you for that. It, it, sometimes I see in, here in the YouTube community, uh, I, I hear stories or I meet people who say, oh, no, 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 technology on my ears. No, I'm going to do this other way. And that makes me a, a little... I feel a little uneasiness because if I'm, if someone asks me, how should I start with treating tinnitus? My advice is start with the things that work for most people, right? So working with a professional helps most people, whether that's a psychologist, a therapist, an audi a good audiologist, like the audiologist on our team at Tribal Health, that would be an, an, a crucial part. A second crucial part is having a comprehensive sound therapy plan. Research seems to support those two things quite well. Alternative therapies, other things to try, it's a mixed bag and that's a very individualized process. But to me, those those two parts, the, the psychological help, the support, the professional counseling, and then the sound therapy are, are the must-haves at the beginning to ride it out. Um, yes. Yes, yes, yes. If you all are here live, please let us know in the chat. We're going to put the chat screen up on the side here. Let's go into some, some live question and answers. So if you have specific questions, then we're going to talk about them. Rahola, nice to see you here, Rahola. Rahola says, Dr. Ben, I just got my Tranquil 2. Those are tinnitus maskers that we provide at Treble Health. And he's wearing them right now. And he's got to say, he's got to say that he loves them. That is a very... Uh, amazing thing to see that is not planned and it almost it almost seems like it's too good to be true that 
you made that as a as the first comment here, Rahola. Thank you. Nice to see you here, uh, Rahola. Please please let us know your experiences. Um, tell us in the comments here what did you not expect about them? What kind of benefits are you getting? And maybe you know why are they not why are they not so good? Tell us all of the all the things you're going through in the comments here. Try to include that. And then we oh, have. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I like Scott's question. He asked about, um, is there a time or day where you might not need sound therapy as much because you've now habituated to the sounds? And I think to the point that you said about how many individuals aren't thrilled about having to use something ear level when you tell them that that's one of the, you know, tried and true methods of helping tinnitus. I think that the, you bring up a great point. If you have habituated or you have points of the day where the tinnitus is not problematic for you, then you don't need to use the sound therapy. Um, oftentimes I've heard Dr. Ben describe sound therapy or the ear level sound generators as a cast. It's definitely something that you're using in the interim to get you to a better place with your tinnitus. It's not something that you're going to have to rely upon from now until forever by any means. And your time, your timeline with using sound therapy can vary. You know, some people it might be a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year, but it's definitely nothing long term, long term or forever. And so you can definitely pick and choose. If you don't have issues sleeping at night because of your tinnitus, then there isn't a need for you to have sound therapy at night. You know, you don't have to use that. For some individuals, it is beneficial to have sound therapy going throughout the night. So it's very, very individual. To heal. And you need to wear a cast during that process. Sorry, you cut out or I cut out. So I missed it. What did you say? I'm sorry. <laughs> It's okay. I, I was explaining. Okay. I'm just gonna put up here. Um, let's go. All right. So let's go to another question here. This one from Roz, Dr. Michelle. Would you like to take this question? Sure. Let's see. Is it do sound using sound maskers slow the progress of habituation since you are not acclimating the brain to the tinnitus sound? So it can, if you are using sound maskers that are louder than your tinnitus, and so you're using them to mask, completely block, cover up your tinnitus, then you are not allowing your brain to acclimate to the sound. And you may be, um, you may be affecting your ability to habituate to the sound. So you have to be able to have exposure to both your own tinnitus as well as the sound masker in order to learn to habituate to the tinnitus. So I love to give the example of getting over a phobia. If your way of, you know, avoiding getting, if you're afraid of something and your method of, you know, your method for that phobia is avoidance. So if you're afraid of snakes, you're afraid of spiders and you decide you're just never going to interact with them again, you're not treating the actual phobia or fear you need to have some level of exposure in order to overcome that phobia. And the same thing goes with tinnitus and using the sound maskers. So you have to have some level of exposure to your tinnitus because as soon as you turn off that sound masker, your tinnitus is going to be oftentimes more pronounced because it's now a novel sound and your brain is really going to pick up on it more. So it's better to use sound maskers that are slightly softer than your own tinnitus level or tend to kind of like mix in your tinnitus and the sound tends to blend together so you're able to pick up on both but you definitely wouldn't want to just completely block it out of course in the beginning if you're ha if you're in that what we call urgent care phase of tinnitus it's okay to use you know fully mask your tinnitus at that point um, to get to a place where you're now able to emotionally and psychologically try to help do things that will help improve it rather than just avoid it. So that would be my recommendation. I don't know if Dr. Ben, you have something different to add or something else to add in terms of completely masking out your own tinnitus with a masker. No, I think you answered that quite well. And I wanted to share the message here by Rahola, who's 
Someone who has used the tinnitus sound therapy through treble health and left a nice comment and I'll read it. Rahola says, I love how my tranquil two, which are the sound maskers that we use just easily slide into my ear without making my ears feel blocked like regular AirPods or headphones. Plus the pink noise generator, which is the pink noise sound is completely soothing to me. That's good. That's very good to hear. And that's the reaction from 80 to 90% of people who use the ear level tinnitus sound therapy is it's relaxing, it's soothing. And when it's in your ear, it's not like headphones that block your ear canal. What's going in your ear is a small piece that has natural holes so that sound in the air can come in and out. So it's, you're hearing the same ambient sound, which is good for your habituation. Plus you're adding sound therapy that's individual to you and only you can hear it. So I'm really happy to hear that. And thank you for commenting on this. Rahola, let's, let's spend about five more minutes answering some live questions. Uh, first, I want to say that you're speaking to two audiologists from Treble Health. You can find us at treblehealth.com. If you wanted to reach out and speak to one of us, then you may be able to do that if you go to our website and our team will be able to help you. So please, if you're interested, don't hesitate to reach out. We're here to help and we'd love to learn about your story and give some advice, uh, provide some recommendations for you. So thank you for that. Let's find a good question to work off of. All right. Um, let me see. I think someone asked about, is there something, is there too much noise protection? Wait, let's see. Um, Donnie Wilson asked, I work in a loud environment, so I use earplugs plus earmuffs for about eight hours a day. Is there such a thing as too much hearing protection? And I would say there isn't. So depend. it depends in terms of use, if you're working in a loud noise and loud noise environment, you want to make sure that you're using hearing protection. Of course, there could be too much ear protection if you're not able to hear others and it's a safety factor. And then you might want to inquire about other devices that allow you to still be able to protect your hearing while still having the ability to hear, for example, someone calling to you or some kind of alarm. So that would probably be the only concern that I would have, just making sure that you're not wearing too much hearing protection, that it affects your ability in terms of being safe in your work environment. But other than that, I would probably recommend you speak with like your maybe, oh, if there's someone that handles OSHA in your workplace and they can also, you know, address whether or not you have any concerns about what kind of level of hearing protection you're using. But it's definitely very important to use hearing protection if you work in the loud environment, especially for an extended period of time. But in general, not too much noise protection, not in a negative way. Excellent. We know more about tinnitus. We know about hearing, hearing aid treatment, hearing loss, hearing aids, as well as hearing protection and earplugs, which is often overlooked. Can we actually prevent hearing conditions? That would That's worth our time to understand. We have an important question here, which asks, do we recommend any prescription meds that can help with anxiety? My tinnitus gets better when I'm very relaxed, but that's not too common these days. So, you're not going to have any audiologist recommend prescription medication. There definitely are prescription medications that can help anxiety. And the first point of contact would be to go to a primary doctor if you have one. If you don't have a primary doctor, because many people don't, then you could go to an, an urgent care or you can find a primary doctor in your local area. And when they know your full medical history, including your tinnitus, they can give a recommendation for medication that may help with anxiety. Additionally, there's other considerations for what may be causing anxiety and that should be explored too. Uh, this is real, this is important. And something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is managing tinnitus is hard. Managing tinnitus can be very difficult and it can be a challenging mental, psychological process. Uh, this is something that we don't necessarily have a healthy conversation about in, in the clinic that yes, we're presenting management options. Yes. We're presenting treatment options yet still it is, it can be challenging and we acknowledge that. And our main message is don't, don't give up and don't lose your hope and your faith. We try our best to publish the success stories for our patients who are willing to go on camera. And those are important to remind us, okay, this 
even though this is not a cure solution, this can be managed to the point where it's no longer a problem in my life. And that's a real transformation. Uh, and, and perhaps the first step is to, to go into what, it, what may be causing anxiety. And, and even if that seems like tinnitus was the cause of anxiety, there's, there's still room to explore and hopefully improve. So we really appreciate this question and mental health is so important. Uh, that's why we do what we do. So thank you guys for being here. We have Donnie saying thank you as well. We're just going to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Michelle. Do you have any last words for us here on today's live stream with Treble Health? Yeah, I was going to kind of go off of what you were just talking about. So obviously, yeah, we're not here to recommend any kind of prescription medications to help with stress, anxiety, or depression, or sleep. But we definitely recommend a lot of holistic measures that can help naturally with some hormones like dopamine, serotonin. So we know things like and getting enough sleep really helps, reducing stresses and stress and anxiety, um, exercise, any kind of meditation, basically anything that benefits your overall physical and mental well-being will also help with those natural hormones that our body has to help us feel better, help with things like inflammation, sleep, um, our mood. So those are things that we often recommend and that we can recommend and that definitely work. I hear all the time from individuals that incorporating things like physical exercise or meditation has really been that last push that they needed to get to a much better place with their tinnitus. So I hope, um, thank you so much for joining us again. And this is our tinnitus guide. You can download it from our website and it has a lot of good information. And as always, you can always reach out and meet with one of us if you think you could benefit from a little bit more support. But know that we're here and that there is hope and help for improving your tinnitus. Dr. Michelle signing off. Bye-bye.